Hi everyone. Great to connect with the community. Thank you Zopa for hosting us and thank you Linux Recruit for organizing this. Um, I'm George. Uh, I work at Bark as Head of Platform Engineering and today we'll talk about how to build an internal development platform fast. And the point is that you can do this with a small team in under two months using open source components. And it's not scary, it doesn't have to feel scary. So a little bit about me, my background is also uh, in software. I was a software engineer for many years and I was interested in uh, working different industries and different um, domains. Um, but at some point I was curious about this thing uh, called cloud technologies, cloud infrastructure, what is it, uh, and platform engineering. So I went to get involved and uh, then I was interested in leadership opportunities and I started managing teams in uh, different regions and um, I've worked with different organizations, different sizes, and uh, I built uh, platforms from scratch, uh, group platforms, and um, uh, built high-performance, high-performing teams as well. Um, a little bit about Bark. Uh, we are a marketplace connecting buyers and sellers. Uh, currently, we're in 11 different countries and growing. Uh, 7 million customers, uh, quite significant. Uh, we have great people, great culture and values. And this is our talent partner, Mert. Uh, you can scan the QR code and stay in touch about roles. And uh, we are based in Paddington, but technology is uh, fully remote. And we have some great perks. And we're over 200 people and growing. Um, I want to give credit to the team uh, who have built this platform. And um, I, I will read out their names. Sahiti is here, so you can ask questions later and we'll stick around to uh, talk to you. Uh, maybe you guys will have some questions for me. <laughs> uh, so this is us and uh, let's talk about um, the platform and the state that it was initially when I joined a year and a half ago. We had different technologies, different architectures and that's fine if you do it in a right way, if it's organized properly and uh, if you have uh, the, um, the right setup. Uh, but honestly, it looked like this. <laughs> So what's wrong with this? Well, it doesn't really look nice, right? It's not easy to maintain, it's not great. Uh, so if you have three different puzzles uh, that you're trying to match and you don't have the picture for reference, then it's very slow to make progress. It's uh, very difficult to do things. And uh, this is one of the main pain points. So where did we start? Uh, we didn't have environment parity and we we're spending lots of time figuring things out, reverse engineering the setup, troubleshooting problems, and that is um, a, a big pain point. And we had some infrastructure in code, not all of it. I don't like the term ClickOps. I hate it, but it was ClickOps. Uh, and when a developer wanted to create a new service and go to production, they had lots of cognitive load. They had um, to spend so much time thinking about Okay, so where do I even deploy this service? What platform do I want to go to? What are my dependencies? What is closer to what I want to build? So this was slowing them down. And then we also had quite a few gaps in our telemetry stack and little documentation. Uh, the documentation we had was out of date. So another pain point. And let's say that we have decided it's going to go to that platform and we want to uh, shape it. So the developer was either dependent on the platform engineering team uh, to set up the infrastructure or if they were in a hurry or if the wait time was too long. Uh, mind you, the platform engineering team was uh, small, so they had to wait for some time. And if they wanted to try use Terraform and build it themselves, it could take easily up to two weeks. So that wasn't great. And also even though after we did some cost optimization, it was still not the best. Uh, there was lots of room for improvement there. And this is why, what we came up with. We combined all of these technologies and we built a new platform that we call Atlas. Why did we call it Atlas? I hear you ask. Uh, it's because we did a, a poll on Slack and that was the name that was chosen. So easy. <laughs> uh, so. I'll tell you a little bit about the approach. Uh, we figured that there are so many different problems and it was just a lot easier to just do a clean start, start from fresh. Uh, no need to try and address each one individually because then in the end you would end up doing this anyway. 
uh, we made the case to the business and explained the problem statement and the benefits that was um, key for this project uh, for this program to take off because if you don't have the business buy-in the senior stakeholder buy-in then you will end up fighting the same problems over and over again uh, it's important to have a product mindset and I know Paula you will agree on uh, plasma engineering uh, doing things with a product mindset you build it in small iterations, you deliver value, you talk to your customers, you don't go into a room and build something that nobody wants to use afterwards. And we kept an architecture decision record. Uh, what does this mean? So if someone asks me, why did we do this this way? Then I don't have to explain it over and over again. I just point them to the documentation that this was a decision. These are the reasons it made sense at the time. If we need to change it, that's fine. But that's the, the reason why. So what did we want from this new platform? We wanted it to be highly available, we wanted it to be resilient, uh, scale, basically what Kubernetes gives you for free. Uh, we wanted it to be easy to troubleshoot, easy to create new services, and we wanted to have a way to manage the QA environments. And we wanted it to be um, cost efficient, and also the last one is um, a business value as well, uh, high developer efficiency. So how did we do that? These are the phases, this is a timeline. Um, I'm, I want to show you here that we had multiple different work streams happening in parallel. Uh, these things don't need to happen in, in sequence. Uh, we started with a planning phase. Um, it was great that we had almost a month to do the planning phase. And at the same time, we were looking to hire talent. And then we started the implementation and also at the same time we were doing the migration planning, thinking about um, what each service does. Uh, so it was more of a discovery phase. Where does each thing live? What are the um, changes that we will have to make to move it to Kubernetes? And then the different phases of the migration. Uh, this platform is actually live now and we were ahead of schedule. We delivered it very quickly uh, in under two months and uh, it starts with defining a very good minimum viable product and this is a learning lesson for many people uh, we underestimate how important it is to define uh, a good minimum viable product uh, sometimes we put a lot of things in scope and we can't deliver uh, we can run behind uh, so what do we want from this uh, setup we wanted it to be a production ready kubernetes cluster running in all the different environments and the environments are isolated uh, as an AWS account. Uh, we wanted to not have any gaps in our telemetry stack and we wanted to do things in a standardized way that is so important. Uh, we can have a talk just in itself. So standardization and uh, predictability and environment parity. And we don't forget about security. We want the security to be built in we partnered with CrowdStrike, we use a number of different AWS services uh, on doing that and best practices uh, on um, secrets management as well. So let's have a look at the technologies again. Uh, this is what we used on the infrastructure side for the telemetry stack, CICD and developer experience. Um, I think the thing that stands out here is backstage. People don't know too much about it, but uh, we'll cover it and I have a short demo for you. And I'll try to play. Okay, it works. Could we possibly do full screen, Mike? Yeah. yeah. So what's happening here is uh, you're looking at the backstage uh, interface, which we call it Atlas UI. And what it does is it allows the developer to specify some inputs to create a new service. Behind the scenes, what this will do is create a repository uh, create all the necessary resources. You can see, you can configure the uh, resources for the service. Uh, you can specify where that repository is going to live and then it will go and do all of that work for you. So immediately uh, you get so much work done and in a, this is the review step and you get it done uh, very quickly and it's all predictable. You have a, a way to start. These are the different steps. It's going to succeed. <laughs> it's not a typical demo where in presentations you have hiccups. That's why we recorded it. Yeah. 
And in Bugsaids, uh, you can uh, customize and build uh, the platform as you want it to be. We have some links uh, for this new application that was created. And you can view the source code. Uh, you can see that this is a completely new repository it was created uh, just now. And it kicks off the GitHub Actions pipeline. And what this will do behind the scenes is run Telegram and provision the infrastructure, create the ECR repository. Here we did it in a branch, but uh, this is because we were testing it. So the infrastructure is created. That was quick. And then we will see Argo CD in a bit doing the sync to have the latest version deployed. We have a separate repository for home charts so that we can um, use automation to deploy the changes there. And this is the Argo CD. Uh, you can see that uh, it's all been set up, it's all been configured automatically. So all of that work is now standardized, um, any application that you use, and you can see that it works. Uh, so this is the application, you get a Route 53 uh, URL and it just works. You have a new application, developers can start writing uh, Python code. Cool. Uh, so there's no point building a platform without having anything to run on it. So uh, what we need to do is uh, start thinking about how do we move our services onto it. And you can see the diagram, it's more like choose your own migration adventure. Uh, depending on uh, what the service looks like and what the dependencies are, that you have to go through the different individual paths. Uh, but we have a, a checklist of things that we want to uh, adhere to, so uh, its migration is done the right way. It started by doing the analysis, understanding what the services are, understanding what the dependencies and all of that. And we have a, a template system, it's almost like a contract where you can define the values and then all the services uh, just uh, need to replace the placeholders and you get the infrastructure provisioning. And uh, the power of this is that uh, with this standardization, you get for free monitoring, centralized logging, alerting, and self-healing infrastructure. Right now, I am on call and I'm doing this talk. It's because we built self-healing infrastructure and I can do it. I can see your surprise there. And this is the first service that we migrated. There was a machine learning uh, algorithm uh, that suggests sellers. And this is what it looks like on the front end. And this is what it looks like on the back end. It runs with quite low latency. And uh, we are very proud of the cost savings that this brought to the business. It used to run in Google Cloud and it was unattended uh, for some time as part of moving it into Atlas. Uh, it saved 70,000 uh, 70, uh, USD for the business. That's on an annual basis, it's not per month. And uh, what's next? So we have the sky is the limit. There are so many things that we can do, but one of the biggest things that this unlocked is the disaster recovery. Uh, this was not possible to do before, but now uh, we can um, do the work and uh, do disaster recovery every six months. We don't have this requirement, but it's good to be able to do it. And we want to have the ability to create environments on demand. Uh, at the moment, we can do this in 40 minutes using Telegram, uh, one command and creates the environment. We want to link this to Atlas so that uh, we can provision new environments from the UI uh, for QA so they can test changes in isolation. Right now we have a fixed version of environments. Break last scenario is important for on call. Um, I wanted to do things like um, when you get privileged access, it's for a temporary basis and then there, it's auditable as well so that people don't have permanent access to PII or things like that. Uh, front-end applications, this is not supported. We started with back-end because that's where the majority of our applications are, but this is a fast follow feature. And um, what's the takeaway from this talk? Um, for me, if you ask me, um, we, uh, we proved that it's feasible to build an EKS infrastructure with small team 
and put it in production in two months and that is really significant and if you want to follow this as a recipe these are the uh, things that i would say you have to do and the power of uh, open source is really significant uh, if you stitch them the right way then you get a, a platform very quickly uh, you might have to do some custom work and uh, write some scripts but yeah really um, kudos to the open source community for doing this kind of work and we can create new platforms very quickly. And a uh, big shout out to our AWS team. Thank you so much for all the support, the learnings and uh, sharing your knowledge. I can see Darren there. Hey Darren. Uh, so Pranav, Yore and Darren, thank you so much for all your work and for your support. Uh, that was it from my side. I will leave some time for questions. <laughs>